I've only been successful because I've been lucky. Luck is a skill and you can hack luck. Fear was actually given to us as a gift. Lion coming towards us, remember how it started. Lion's coming towards us, we feel fear. That fear powers us up to think differently, to move faster. We literally can run faster when we feel fear. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to leverage fear to take risk. And if you take risk, you get more luck and more luck equals more success. I think everyone's got to learn to do. Moaning's okay, but then start saying to yourself, not what am I gonna do when I grow up? That's the wrong question asked at school. What you should be asked is, what problem are you gonna solve? Would you start your own business? That's the opening line by Simon Squibb, who is the TikTok sensation. He has over a million followers on there, and this man has seen it all. He's gone from being homeless to selling a company for tens of millions of pounds by the age of 40. Be happy, never content. Please subscribe and enjoy this episode. Right, welcome back to my podcast, Stephen Sully Study. I'm here at Woodbury House, my second home in Soho. I've got a really good guests in front of me. So to introduce you, this man has got an amazing following. Before we talk about your following, be before we talk about the YouTube videos and things which are going viral, I want to talk a little bit about your background. In short, I said to you off camera that the research I've done is you're a serial entrepreneur, You've uh, started many businesses, you've sold many businesses, you invest into many businesses and you help a lot of people. The one that keeps on coming up is this um, creative agency called Fluid. I believe it was based in Hong Kong and you sold to PricewaterhouseCooper. I know you're not legally allowed to talk about the numbers, but what kind of, what kind of uh, life changing amount was it? Well, it was enough money that I don't have to worry about money ever again unless I do something really stupid or the pound keeps dropping. But as long as those things stay steady, I should never have to personally worry about having an income again. And that allows me now to do what I want to do, which is give people that same power, financial freedom. So being uh, homeless at 15 years of age, then retiring at 40, which if you really think about it, as a 15 year old, you think 40 is a million miles away. But now me being 36, it's actually not. It's gone very, very quickly since I was 15. How do you go from one paradox, being completely homeless on your own, probably scared, frightened at times, to now feeling empowered, feeling successful, and you've got the finances around, around you to have a really great life? How do you go from one extreme to the other? Well, I think it is a, it's a journey, isn't it? Like, like everybody's story, my, mine has highs and lows. And ironically, that incredible low, um, my father died. And then three weeks later, my mother kicked me out of home. And so I was homeless, go from having a family around me, three brothers, a father, a mother, and having what I would consider, I guess, a supportive life to being alone was an awful, awful period of my life. But in a weird twist, bad luck can end up having a good luck element to it. And I have the life I have today that I love, a family I love, a little boy I love, and a purpose in my life around my work that drives me that I wouldn't have had, I don't think, if I hadn't had that pain when I was young. I think the key was learning to leverage the pain in a positive way and see, I'm now going back and helping the 15 year old me, right? And if I hadn't had that experience of being homeless, having nothing, not knowing business, school let me down, I didn't know anything about anything, like a lot of 15 year olds, when they've been in school seven, eight years already, how is that possible? Mm. So now I have that drive to go and fix that problem and fix the education system and take on the system and go out there because of that pain I had when I was younger. Yeah, so do you think it's important at a, at a young age who developed this kind of silver lining mentality no matter what you're going through personal business friendship social group whatever you've got to always see the benefits in the scenario you're going through in short yes i mean it's an old saying isn't it you've got to see uh, you've got to be an optimist to be successful i've interviewed over 200 people on my podcast the world's most successful entrepreneurs billionaires pretty much the trait they all have is this optimistic approach to life if there is an economic downturn we find a way of making it work. If there's good economic times, we find a way of making it work. I think there's that that belief that actually at the end of the day, all of these things are just sent to test us. The bigger the test, the more opportunity. Do you know like when you're younger though, and unless you've got someone like yourself or like a, a mentor, someone very successful, telling the young person this kind of characteristic trait to have or this mindset, some, a lot, can actually find themselves you know the compound interest effect where you keep on doing something right over time, it's just going to blow up and you're going to become wildly successful. But the compound interest can actually work in reverse. And sometimes when they start getting the negativity at a young age and they start turning to the wrong sort of side of life, 
that can also compound and they find themselves in a great big hole. A little bit like maybe this Jeremiah guy that you interviewed who's homeless. So before we talk about him, how how can a young person suddenly switch it around? Well, you know, in fairness, it um, my five-year-old's into Star Wars at the moment. It's like the dark side and being a Jedi, isn't it? I mean, everyone's got the power to be something. And, and the dark side is quite alluring, isn't it? And, and I say, for example, potentially crime or being negative about the universe. Moaning about people is very British. We you know we like to moan about the weather and it, hmm. it translates into moaning about our politicians and then it can be moaning about our lives. And I think sometimes moaning is good, actually. But then you've, what you've got, I think everyone's got to learn to do. Moaning's okay, but then start saying to yourself, not what am I going to do when I grow up? That's the wrong question asked at school. I'll ask of us as people. What you should be asked is, what problem are you going to solve? So let's stop moaning about these problems and start fixing them. And I think that's the spin everyone should try to include in their life. Don't don't look at it. You can moan. I moan. I'm not always positive. But then I deliberately work towards a solution for some of the things I moan about. I think that would really help people if they did that. Did that. Yeah, yeah, that's really good mindset to have. Just touching on, because I'm in business myself and I feel like I'm pretty ambitious. My business partner, very ambitious. And we really want to get the best out of our industry and solve all the problems and be known and be good at what we're kind of known for right now um the first company you ever sold or the first large amount of money what did you do with that kind of money and how did you feel so so looking back i mean different stages of my life large amounts of money were different amounts and when i was younger um, i i started a little company and it did quite well and i sold it for what i thought was a huge amount of money at the time about fifty thousand pounds and you know, I remember thinking, "Wow, I've made it!" You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I think I was 19 when I got 50,000 pounds, and you know, to me that was it. I kind of that's it. I've got a load of money. That's a year's plus two years uh, salary at the time, and so that's it. I'm free. And I think when I realised that that you still need to do something, even though I suddenly had the potential to do nothing, um, I went on a plane to Hong Kong and I moved to Hong Kong. And I thought, what money really brings you? What I learned quite young was money doesn't really buy you anything except experiences that's the only thing that really matters so I, I call this buying time mm. right buying time to develop yourself buying time to experience the world you know if you uh, I'm, I'm very anti-mortgages I hate people that get I hate people getting trapped by mortgages I mean buying a house they think it's going to make them rich it doesn't it often traps people in a location it creates a monthly cost which means they've got no choice but to pay it and so I, I love the idea that you can be free financially and, and I learned that quite young by accident by making what I thought at the time was a lot of money as I made more money, what I actually started to do, I never really wanted to take a large sum of money and put it in my bank. That did happen when I was 40, when I sold Fluid, but that was not my aim. My aim was always any amount of profit I made in my businesses, I put back into the businesses, back to compound you were just mentioning. So I remember one month, um, my agency made half a million pounds profit. And so I was very tempted to take that money out and I could have bought a flat and rented it out, right? And a lot of people would say, that's what you should do because that's the norm, right? But um, Elon Musk, when he made 110 million from PayPal, he could have gone and bought a, half of Las Vegas probably at that time, property-wise, and, and be renting them out today and never have to work again in his life. But that's not the point, right? Of course, he didn't do that, and I didn't do it either. I, I kept putting the money back into what I loved doing. I wanted to make what I was doing bigger, stronger, faster, better. And that compound paid off over time. That's why I got a big payoff. I didn't actually, even when I did get the big payoff, really want it to be honest. I mean, once I sold the company, it's a dream, right? And it's a headline, built a company from scratch and sold it for, for tens of millions. Uh, but for me, that was not really the exciting bit. The exciting bit was building the company. And in some respects, I have regret selling that company because I had to start again. <laughs> and so it was something about starting again that's also liberating, but there's also an element of me that you know I actually enjoyed building. And I didn't really, going forward, like what I'm building now, I'll probably never sell it. I'm building something that is a legacy product that hopefully will help people for hundreds of years to come. And so, yeah, money money becomes secondary when you have a purpose, I think. Yeah. So I'm a great believer that money, the benefit of money gives you choices. You know, um, if you have a massive amount of money, you have a choice whether you want to work today or not. If you have a massive amount of money, you have a choice whether you go on holiday today or not. You know, you can do whatever you want when you want. And I think... When people say it's not so important, and there's other more more important things. Yes, there are. There there is. Floyd Mayweather said something right, and love him or not, he's one of the best belt boxers ever lived. And some of his philosophies are quite bang on. And they said, well, money's not everything. He said, no, but it it 
they said money doesn't solve all your problems. He says yes, but it solves your money problems, and that's a good place to start. And I think it is because a lot of a lot of problems, even sometimes health, is off the back end of being stressed because maybe of the money scenario. So with this company, Fluid, and also with Hong Kong, why did you decide to set up this creative agency? What gave you the idea and why, why in Hong Kong? Well, first of all, um, it wasn't really an idea. Um, I, I met someone very beautiful called Helen Griffiths when I went to Hong Kong after I sold my company. And uh, she was a designer, a very talented designer. And she was telling me about how much she was getting paid to do a particular project and I just couldn't believe how low the price was so I said to her I'll, I'll be your agent you know this isn't right I have like um people need to charge properly for their services and I'm like you're not charging properly and she was a brilliant designer who didn't like talking to customers she just wanted to do her job um, of designing and so she was undercharging so I kind of took over a little bit and then started negotiating some of her deals and then I realized that there was a real gap in the agency world in Hong Kong it was actually 1997 um, there was a handover in Hong Kong of uh, Hong Kong back to the British and a lot of British people left so um, basically long story short I said to Helen let's let's start a company together what should we call it and we came up with the name fluid it was nothing more than that you know I just met a really talented beautiful person who was undercharging for their services and I felt like I could help her and defend um, a price strategy and and that's what it, I did and it turned into this massive company because then we brought on lots of designers that had exactly the same problem my business wasn't actually working for like the CNN and the Estee Lauders of this world who are our clients I was actually working for the designers that's what made us a little bit different I was there to help the designers get valued okay. help the creatives get valued and give them the time to do their work and so, um, but yeah, I mean, Fluid was, was uh, people always think, oh, you know, genius, you came up with this idea, genius. Fluid wasn't one of those ideas that I came up with that was genius. Um, I came up with a few businesses since then that were created in, our, in my mind and made real. But Fluid was really just two people talking, me and Helen, solving a problem, which in the end wasn't just created for brands, which they needed, but for the actual designers themselves. And maybe like the artwork we're surrounded by in this studio, you know, at some point someone needs to defend the artist. Someone needs to represent the artist make people realize how valuable this stuff is that's around us some people don't realize that that's what it was like in the creative space in asia at that time a lot of people don't or didn't at the time appreciate a quality creative they just said do us a brand by tomorrow at 12 not understanding there's a process not understanding there's a talented person behind that that, that creation yeah what was it just like um you know on a personal level living in hong kong uh well interestingly when i first got there i i um i hated it uh, i couldn't whoever's been there you will probably know what i mean when you first get there the skyline is unbelievable the whole city this it, it's just an incredible energy in in that city and and what's kind of amazing is when you look at these skyscrapers and the skyline is mountains it's just incredible no natural resources it's all made from someone's brain into reality so it's all built on in imagination and ingenuity of course there's an incredible history there around um, opium and, and the drug trade and Britain trying to defend the roots of drug trade ironically wanting access to the drugs <laughs> um, but the, uh, the the actual city itself the people there are just pure energy and you know I, I when I first got there one of the things for example I was an entrepreneur in England I got there and had to learn to work like I, I, I thought I was working hard in England as an entrepreneur. It wasn't until I went to Hong Kong that I realized I wasn't, you know, like there was no work-life separation. So, and that's something I found quite hard to deal with at first. Like Friday night, I wanted to cut off and go out, you know, but not in Hong Kong. What you do is you go out on a boat with people you do business with, you know, like you don't, there's no separation. And it took me probably about a year to turn and realize that this is the way to live actually this this do what you love work with people you love working with and then your social life is your work life actually that's cool but I didn't like it at first um, and it was hugely populated the apartments are really small compared to what you can get in England to, for accommodation versus there I was like why would I want to live in this little little dinky property when I could go and have a nice house in a country in England you know like learning mm. to accept that these possessions i.e. a place you live is not that important but what you do is important in some respects is the opposite to how England operates right mm -hmm. everyone's about their home and sometimes people are willing to do a shit job or a job they hate to pay for their home so it's complete reverse in Hong Kong which I found hard initially to get used to I was going to bring you back to that statement that you made because I probably just like you listen to a lot of um, people that have been there done it personal development 
gurus, I call them, or very successful entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires. I think you have to because just like your body, you need to exercise it. Just like your mind, you need to exercise it. Um, Grant Cardone is quite famous for saying that. Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, quite famous for saying it. Your home isn't an asset, it's a liability, which I totally get after understanding what they meant by that. And then someone more recently was talking about it, but a bit more kind of blunt and more aggressive, who's now been banned off social media, was his Alan Tate. Mm. And they've all got a very, very similar kind of view on, uh, you know, your own, your own home not being an asset, being a liability. But from your perspective, if someone said to maybe your son at school, what you should do is save all your money and buy yourself a house and do not rent, what would you say back to that? Well, um, first of all, it, for me, from my experience, I meet a lot of people in their 30s who bought a house in their 20s because they were told that's how to get rich. And now they're trapped by that house. So one of the things that's never talked about is people get location lock. People say they'll buy the house and they'll rent it out, but they don't. They get stuck in that house and they get stuck in that location, wherever it is. They don't go where the opportunity is. If I said to them, go to Hong Kong, there's an opportunity there. You're 29 years old, go to Hong Kong. I know a lot of people that, like, well, I've got a house and oh, my friends all around there. And they don't, they don't make that commitment for, to go and make an opportunity happen. And often it's the property that's got them stuck. The other thing is, as soon as you have a fixed monthly cost and you take up all your spare cash deposit money into that property, then you're trapped because you don't have any spec cash. So I took the 50,000 pounds that I had, I could have put it into a property, but I put it into my next business. And how did I spend that money on my next business? Well, I bought myself time to think about it. I bought myself time to put time into that business. And one of the businesses I started was a business called Coaster Ads, which is advertising on coasters. It cost me nothing to start this business and I made two million pounds from it. Tell me a house that gives you that return. Hmm. Now people listening might be thinking, well, you know, maybe you were lucky, maybe, um, you, you uh, which is true. We could talk about luck, I have a formula hack luck if people are interested but more importantly um no i i think that it's because the more risk you take the luckier you get and actually buying a house isn't that risky which ironically is why people think you should do it but when you're young you should be taking risk so if i was talking to my younger self i'd say take more risk travel backpack see the world see how big it is go see all the opportunities how many people have gone overseas seen something really working in another market and brought it back to their home market for example if they hadn't gone and done that traveling they would never have seen it you know, you've got to really experience the world is what I say to young people. But one of the things I'll say quickly on this point that isn't talked about much, um, even by the people you just mentioned, you know, a lot of the time people will talk about assets and good, bad, luck, good debt and bad debt. Now, I know um, there are there is good debt and bad debt. Most people listening, I'm sure, know the, the difference. Right. But even good debt is bad, in my opinion. Right. There was this whole thing done on the people that have lived the longest in, in in life. They were interviewed, like, what made you think you live? Why did you live so long? A lot of the time, the answer was because they live within their means. You know, and I know it sounds boring, but you kind of do something you love every day and live within your means. You'll live longer. A lot of people that get themselves into a lot of good debt end up managing 500 houses and being totally miserable and dying young from the stress of managing good debt, as did my dad at 56 years old killed over of a heart attack from the stress of managing good debt Fuck hell. burnt out almost burnt out burnt out worried um didn't eat well because of it depressed maybe stressed managing you know a big expensive house and household on top of the pressures of, of having to manage the property market high and lows and mm. and you know that was all under good debt that's all under this bracket that everyone preaches in good and rich dad poor dad too or oh, good debt is good mm. and and I, I i would argue that they've all got it wrong and, and actually, the best way to live is within your means. And actually, hopefully, I bought my house that I live in today cash. Every single day I see a message on TikTok that says I shouldn't have done that. Every single day I see a message that says I shouldn't have done that. I sleep quite well at night because I did. Especially mm. when I see interest rates going up and this going up and that going up. I, have, I could have bought a house twice as big, right? I could have bought myself a 25 million pound house if I'd gone and got debt, sure. But why do I need that? Mm. I recently interviewed John Caldwell, you know him? Rings a bell. He's the billionaire. He's the only billionaire in the UK apparently that actually pays tax. But right. he sold phones for you. Just interviewed him on my podcast. And he talked about his house. He's got the biggest house in Hyde Park. One of the, he personally owns the biggest house in Hyde Park. <coughs> he was saying he only heats and lives in 10% of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and so I, I don't know. I think um, living in Hong Kong, living in a small apartment in Hong Kong, as I did when I first moved there, kind of also made me realize minimalistic life is pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, you don't need lots of space and stuff. 
and, and actually what, what the most important thing to invest in is enjoying your day to day. And people don't spend enough time investing in that. They'd rather put it into the stock market and invest in someone else or put it in crypto and hope it goes up. But they won't spend it on themselves to find out what they're meant to do and then do it. Hmm. It's funny, actually, because I've, I've, you read all this sort of um, stuff on social media, Instagram, and some of it I know is probably made up and some of it is, is, is factual. But in short, the billionaires in this world started with nothing, a lot of them, built up these mega companies, these mega brands, which are still going today. They either sell it or get a, an investor in or whatever, and they come out with loads of money. And their pursuit is to try and build this mega brand to serve all these people, but also enjoy the benefits of that private jets, the big yachts, the big houses, the lovely cars, helicopters, etc. And they do all that. And then later on, they spend their time giving away that money they work really hard for. And it's a bit weird how the circle of life goes round, you know. And like you have just, it's not an epiphany moment, but it's almost like, actually, what is the most important thing here? Is it really all this stuff? Yeah, don't get me wrong, there's a place for it in life. But there's other stuff that I think you start realising is actually really, really important. I think the question people need to ask themselves more, and I wish I'd asked myself this a bit earlier too, is like, if I had all the money I need, what would I do? Because here's the thing, I now do have all the money I need and I'm doing what I wanna do with the purposeful project, but I don't need all the money I've got to do it. That's the irony. So, so I think a lot of people, like I asked a friend the other day, you know, who's complaining they don't have enough money to do what they wanna do. I'm like, well, what do you wanna do? This video, I've just gone viral on TikTok. This guy, he's got a dream to open up his restaurant, but he thinks he needs half a million pounds to do it. So he's working in a job to try and get the money to do his dream. And actually people are, don't wait five years to do your dream. Don't wait 10 years until you've got the perfect setup to do your dream. Do it now. Do it now. I think most people listening, if they just pause this podcast for a minute and sat back for five minutes and say, what is it I'd like to do? They'll come up with an idea. Now that idea might then straight link them to, I need this amount of money to do it. Well, okay, so how are you gonna get this amount of money to do it? But sometimes the money is the excuse. Like I want to help people. I actually don't need a lot of money to do that. I can give my time. That's, what, that's the money I need is to pay for my time, right? So mm. if I've got my debts down to zero, my outgoings down to zero, then I can do that, can't I? Mm. I don't need hundreds of millions to do what I'm destined to do, which is go back and help that 15-year-old me, right? Yeah. So a lot of people will have that. They won't realize it. They're going to wait until they retire to have a good time. Why? It's crazy. Why are you going to wait until you retire? By that time, your bones will start to ache. You won't be able to go on the long walks perhaps you dreamed of doing one day. Do it now. Mm. So going back to your following, very, very impressive. Uh, got down here 8.3 million likes on your tiktok account today you're very very close to having a million followers on there no doubt it's going to go over that instagram 22.3 thousand followers you've got over 45,000 people subscribed to your youtube i mean when did you start this mission of trying to build on this build up this online presence of yourself and what is your social media accounts all about well what what is your mission behind that so i started two years ago and I, I initially just wanted to download the knowledge that I have about business to people that need it. So I just went on TikTok, I had a little baby and I was looking after him and I was like, okay, I need to do something while he's sleeping or something. So I went on TikTok and I just said, hey everybody, um, you know, um, who needs help? Um, who wants to start a business? Who wants some mentorship? I'm not gonna charge, I'm never gonna charge anybody for help. This isn't me trying to sell you a course. I'm gonna try and be different. I'm not selling you a course. I'm just gonna help people. What, what do you need? All the knowledge I've got, not behind a paywall, just for free. And slowly people would start asking me questions. How do I raise money? How do I build a brand? How do I find my purpose? How do I start a business? What's the first five steps? These sorts of things, very simple things that should be taught at school right? Should be taught at school. I say it again, crazy. Financial literacy should be taught at school. The first experience a lot of young people have with money is debt. Hmm. Crazy. They come out of university with a debt. This is wrong. So I just started fixing that in the way that I could one by one, individual by individual. And slowly but surely, and it was very slow at the beginning, you hear it all the time about social media, right? People will say it takes two years. I posted every single day some piece of useful knowledge, my perceived view of useful knowledge. 
And then as the technology evolved, I maybe I was in the right place at the right time, but a combination of live, as we are live right now on TikTok to thousands of people, you know, we, we also at the same time got the opportunity to um, interact with people. So I started building an organization around it. So instead of just being me giving advice, I thought, right, I've got a lot of friends out there who also have advice because my opinion isn't always right for everyone. My background's a certain background. My story is a certain story. There are people out there, for example, that don't think you should start a business with a co-founder. I interviewed Nick Jenkins, who started Moonpig. Yeah. He didn't think a co-founder was needed. I love that perspective because I have the opposite view. I believe still building a business with a co-founder is the best thing I've ever done. Every business I've done with a co-founder has succeeded. Every time I've done it on my own, it hasn't worked. So I have a different experience and therefore a different bit of advice to say what Nick Jenkins has to say. And so I really wanted to bring out that knowledge that everybody out there has that could help anyone that doesn't have that knowledge, that wasn't given to them at school, learn how to do business. And that's what my channels were about. And then in the last, I guess, six months, um, we've really kind of, frankly, figured out a, a really interesting way or interesting formula because what we noticed um when as we scaled up beyond just me giving advice and started doing you know let's say educational content is a lot of the time you can do a video of me in my house with my nice car and you know in my jacuzzi or whatever and it gets lots of views but oh cool nice lifestyle man you know i was like um looking through in someone's house like mtv cribs people love all that and then if i was to say hey do you want to know how you can buy your house cash do you want to know how you can do this people switch off either they think it's a scam which is a sad reality of how the world's become. People think it's just an upsell, which in my case it isn't, but that's out there. Mm. Or people don't realize they need to learn this stuff, right? It's not entertaining enough. So we've built a formula, which I call fun education, which is um, listening to people's stories. I, I, I stop people in the street and I ask them their dreams. And it turns out I've, I've asked probably a thousand people at this point in the last six months, everybody has a dream. Everybody has a dream and some dreams are small and some dreams are big, depending on your definition of small and big. But bottom line is everyone has a dream. And then we take those stories and we make them real. So it's like Dragon's Den, but an update version. Instead of I take 50% off you and then I'll help you and introduce you to Sainsbury's or whatever, I just help you and we record it. And it's been inspirational for me when I get to help these people, but also watching the community. So we put up a video yesterday of a guy called David who has a dream of doing a restaurant. 24 hours later, 9.8 million views, 1.3 million likes, and thousands of people in the comments offering to help him. So it's not just me anymore educating people about business. It's not just me helping David. It's a whole nation hmm. helping people. And his brand is now well known, known across London. You ask anyone between the ages of 20 and 27 in London, they'll know about this video. Hmm. And that's the power of social media to do social good. And this is what gets me really excited because I see now, you know, it started off with just me giving up my time and what it's evolving into is a community giving their time. Because you know what? We've got to help each other right now. We can't rely on the government to fix our problems. We've known that. We've known that for 100 years. But, you know, stop thinking that's going to happen and start taking personal responsibility for helping our neighbours, for helping the person at the end of the street that's homeless. Start doing things for each other. Go back to being tribal. Mm. Off uh, off camera, I, I spoke about my limiting belief that I had with social media, and then I sort of gave into it a few years back. Uh, started my podcast about four years ago, and I sadly sadly came onto TikTok uh, at the start of the year. And I've got to tell you, the one that I was a bit uh, afraid of, I would probably say, because I didn't understand it, and my misconception was tiktok is only used by young kids who are going to do a funny little dance on it um it's actually been the most successful one for me the conversion over to youtube and stuff what is your message to anybody looking to start doesn't even have to be a business but just to get their message out there to maybe help other people or, or it might be to start a business um social media specifically tiktok i mean what what's your message to those people so i've actually been in the marketing game for 20 years that's a big part of what fluid used to do right so um and, and what I've always noticed about marketing is the platforms will change over time. And a lot of your listeners might not even remember MySpace, but, you know, mm. I started out dabbling in MySpace campaigns with brands. So, you know, I, I, I've seen it all. And, and I would say um, one thing I would say to, to listeners, putting myself in their shoes, is before you jump onto any platform, because we say TikTok's good, and I agree with you, TikTok's amazing, but it might not be the platform for you. And you've got to look at what your skill is, what is endurable for you as a person, as a brand. What can you do every day that's not going to feel like work? 
kind of the whole principle of life actually you know social media you need to take the same strategy so for example some people listening might like to write things then do a blog every day on linkedin you know you don't have to go and do tiktok because that's the cool trend right now or learn to leverage tiktok by writing filming you writing a script people will wait to the end to watch it you know like start making social media work within the boundaries of what makes you happy i like talking to camera i don't mind it i love people seeing you know i like to be seen and i like to be useful that's my agenda right from a yeah. personal perspective why i'm doing this so you no know, that to me go on tiktok and share my knowledge or connect with someone and help them i enjoy that i feel good doing that so in a way be selfish about your social media strategy and figure out what's going to be good for you and if you're not doing the social media make sure it's good what's good for the company right ultimately for me social media is about bringing value to people that's how you make social media work for you and if people start thinking about the audience instead of themselves they will they will fly on social media but the first step is ironically to think of yourself what is sustainable for you i can do a video every day on tiktok it's no problem i do it when i'm walking down the street it doesn't feel like work but if you start planning it out too much overthinking it then suddenly it takes them three weeks to do a tiktok and it's painful mm. and so i think you know my advice would be do what makes you feel comfortable do something you love and then just do it every day um and the person who came with me this morning zach who was just mm. joined joined before we uh, pressed record today he does a tiktok every day he hasn't got a huge following but he enjoys it he will eventually have a huge following Definitely. you know because he enjoys it yeah. And he's actually sharing knowledge. He's he's showing people what his day is like as a very high profile tech CEO every day. You know, yeah. like and that's the key, I think. And and don't worry about the likes at the beginning. People listening might say, Oh, I did this video, I liked it, but I only got ten likes. It doesn't matter. You know, you can do it every day because you enjoy it and it will eventually pay off. Out of curiosity, how many times a day do you post on TikTok? It depends on see again, this is people all talk about the TikTok strategy I, I have a relationship direct with tiktok i've done a partnership with okay. tiktok we did a campaign called be your own boss you can type it in tiktok and have a lot we got so, 820 yeah. million views in three weeks right oh. so um and and so I, I i literally have a direct line with tiktok and every week this comes up in the discussions with creators you know how many times should you post when should you post what time of day look at the analytics all of it is bullshit and i don't know if i'm allowed to swear sorry of course you have. um but you know I, I i think that at the end of the day again Make it fit within your lifestyle. Stop trying to overanalyze the analytics. People say post at 11, post at four, post twice a day, post five times a day. It doesn't matter. The, the algorithm works basically like this. This is the simplest way to put it. It will change all the time, the ins and outs, but the bottom line is it wants to show people content that is interesting to people. That's it. So you could post 10 videos and they could all do well, or you could post 10 videos and they all do badly. It won't make any difference. If the content isn't right, the content isn't right. So it's not about the strategy on the posting and all that and how many times you post. It's about the type of content that you post, which is why I say make it selfish. If you post it and you like it and you get 10 views and you're proud of it and it helps 10 people that viewed it, 10, that's great, mm. right? If it's not on brand for you or it isn't you, I see a lot of people that become a persona to get likes and then later they have come into a lot of pain because they're having to pretend to be whatever that persona was that originally got them those likes. Mm. Or worse, they follow a music trend on TikTok, that video goes viral, and then the next video they post that actually is them and not a viral song that doesn't go anywhere. They're like, oh, what happened? Because all of their followers are waiting for another TikTok viral song video. You see what I mean? So you've got to stay true to yourself, your own brand. And so yeah. every day I posted, I posted what you could argue is boring business content, and the next person on the feed was doing this incredible backflip in the air on top of a slide in a park. Whoa, how can I compete with that? I can't do a backflip into a pike slide, right? So I have to just stay true to what I know and what my value is. And I think a lot of people listening need to do the same. Yeah. The uh, Jeremiah story, I, I watched uh, that part earlier. A uh, homeless man in Brighton. And I know you had a interview with him. You then handed him some money. And then shortly after when you went to try and reconnect to him, you couldn't find him. Can you tell us a bit more about this, this story and uh, what was your motivation behind that? Yeah, so um, maybe I take a step back and, and just say again, you know, I was homeless. So when I walk past someone that's homeless, I, I always feel, I remember when people walked past me and made a judgment about me. And I remember even, you know, asking for help and people almost like, well, you're just going to spend it on drugs, aren't you? Or, you know, the assumption of why I was homeless. Can I ask and be direct? Was was you ever on drugs? Never. Or, or I've never drunk alcohol. Really? I've never I've never been on drugs. I just, I, I have an addictive personality, which means, you know, 
um, I, if I if I do something, I end up like work. I'm really addicted to work. Committed to yeah, it. I'm committed to it. So if I did drugs, I'd be a proper drug addict. I think. So I just <laughs> I just better stay away from it all. And I have my whole life, including alcohol, for that matter too. So, so as I say, I, I don't I don't touch these things. But um, but I, I noticed when I'm because I moved back to England about five years ago. One of the things that really shocked me when I moved back was how many people were homeless, and. In a modern society, this shouldn't happen. And what, what I feel is homelessness has been created by us in modern times. Homelessness didn't used to exist. We created it in modern times. How can that be? Because originally, you know, we were tribal. We'd live in a field or we'd live in caves. If we're living in a field, and we've all got tents and we see someone in our tribe that doesn't have a tent. They either come into our tent or we make them one. No one's living outside in the rain with no food. And even if they've got mental health issues, the tribe rallies around them and does things to try and help them. Right? That's how it used to be. But then the banks came along, gave us mortgages. Then we all bought our own homes and we closed the door and we don't speak to our neighbours anymore. In fact, they annoy us. We go to the end of the street and I'm, I'm living in Bellsize Park at the end of my street. You know, I'm living in you know, houses that are worth five, 10, 15 million dollars, right? So you know, I'm living next door to Ricky Gervais. Yeah? So down the end of the street, it's, love, two, it's two love homeless Ricky people. Gervais. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. love him too. But at the end of the street is a homeless person. Yeah. So how, how can we live in these houses and in some at the end of the street? By the way, we live in these houses with spare rooms, right? And then a human being, you think how incredible a human being is, how, what a miracle it is that that person is even alive. He's just left his own devices at the end of the street. Now, there's a lot of reasons people think that, that should, that's the way it is, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners will have their opinions. But the truth is, what I wanted to do was start actually listening to the reason they're there. Not judge. I call this give without take. Not judge not decide for ourselves why they're there, not assume if I give them money they're going to go buy alcohol, not assume anything, just hear their story. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back to my roots, help people that need it without any judgment. So I just sat, originally I sat with a, a, someone called Andrea, and Jeremiah was the second person I actually helped, but I sat originally with Andrea, who was homeless in Hampstead, which is a very affluent part of London um, where, where I live. And um, she uh, told this incredible story about how she became homeless. And she is actually an ex-drug addict, her own words. She's an ex-drug addict. She takes medicine every day to stop her from being a drug is addict. Is this Jeremiah? No, no, this is Andrea. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll come to Jeremiah in a minute, but okay. I think the Andrea story is, I'm, I'm a little bit further along with Andrea okay. than I am Jeremiah, so I think I can give your audience a little bit of an insight as to where this, is, where this could go. But So and Andrea tells us the story about how she um, she got homeless, and it's a, it's a sad story. 9.3 million people saw her story um, from the time we posted up the video. Again, in a very short period of time, 9.3 million people. The education on homelessness alone in that video, I think, is tremendous. Understanding how someone can end up on the streets. And then um, I gave her some money that day that I uh, she told the story uh, for two or three nights accommodation. And I bought her some ice cream and, you know, and, and so on. Anyway, I went back a few days later um, and she was back on the street. because She's run out of money again. And, and I said, I've got to show you this video. Um, you know, millions and millions of people. Um, hearing your story and in the comments you, if you go read the comments on TikTok I make you cry people are like I'll give you a home what can I do for you you're so sweet what can I do it's so many kind people because people are actually kind despite what people think sometimes mm. I've noticed serious kindness out there 99% of people are seriously kind and so um, all this outpouring of love so I went to tell her and I said, look, why don't you, Andrea, go on TikTok and just say hello to everybody and take up some of these offers that people are giving you to help you and she's like, I don't have a phone I'm like, okay. And here's something interesting. I then want to buy her a phone and there's no phone shop that doesn't let you, that lets you buy a smartphone off contract. So because she doesn't have address, an address, which means all homeless people, nearly all homeless people do not have a smartphone, right? And, and just begin to realize what that, that means. A lot of access to knowledge and information that the, the homeless folks don't have access yeah. to because they can't get a phone because they can't go on contract. Only one shop sells a phone off contract, which I found out the hard way trying to find one. That's Argus. Right, big shout out to Argus. They're not a sponsor of mine, but they should be because it's the only place I could find a phone that wasn't on contract. So we bought Andrea a phone and I use this as a way of like, instead of just giving Andrea money and like giving her a fish every day, I call this, we gave her a fishing rod. And we said, here's a phone, Andrea. Do you like social media? She said, yeah, I did when I used to, you know, was younger, be on social, I liked it. I was like, okay, let me teach you how TikTok works. This is how you make money on TikTok. Let's set you up with an account on TikTok. So we did. And in 36 hours, she got 110,000 followers. And she makes, on average now, 50 pounds a day from TikTok. 
So she doesn't need me, you or anyone else to give her money. She can go on social and make money for herself. She tagged herself, this was her idea, not mine, as a homeless influencer, right? And, and on TikTok, I was number one ranked on TikTok recently. As number one ranked person on TikTok, you earn about £5,000 a week, right? So the top 20 are earning on average that per week in TikTok. Imagine if all the top 20 people on TikTok every single month were homeless folks. And, there was, and what's amazing about Andrea's story, and I wasn't expecting this, is that she shows behind the scenes of what it's like to be homeless in Britain. And, you know, she's actually happier than you think. <laughs> you know, she has happy moments. Someone walking past who's wearing a, a funny hat makes her smile and she shares it. You know, like, we take for granted our lives sometimes. You go watch Andrea's TikTok. I'm inspired by her happiness with the simple life she's got. And also at the same time, I think it sheds a light on what homelessness is really like and the struggle to get out of homelessness. She is now off the street. She has accommodation. It was bloody hard to make that happen because we couldn't get her a bank account. You know all these ads, you haven't got an address, you can't get a bank account, can't get a job. Those banks have not solved that problem because we fought hard to get her a bank account. She's got £3,000 in the bank. She's got an income. She's got a community and now she's launching a crafts business. So we've taken her from, you know, frankly, a difficult situation on the street, hoping one day that social services will help her get somewhere to live, forget an income, right? And we can flip it on its head and say, actually, we can give the power to these folks by giving them the fishing rod and giving them a phone. It's not that. It cost me initially a thousand pounds, a bit of money for accommodation, some money for food, buy her a phone and a bit of time to train her. And then I just told my social community to help her and they did. And now she's able to support herself. It's incredible, like just completely changed their life. Um, the question I want to ask you then, because it's not something I've thought about too much, but how do you monetize TikTok? So there's quite a few different ways. First of all, there is a creator fund. So if you, and I'm, I'm on the creator fund, it's not huge money, but it's a bit like how YouTube works. If you get a certain amount of views, then you get a certain amount of income. And so that's, that's one way. Um, I get brand deals. So I sponsored by GoDaddy and sponsored by QuickBooks, MailChimp. So brands that are aligned with my goal to help people start and grow a business work with me, sponsor, sponsor me. So that's, that's another way. Um, the, uh, on TikTok recently, you can do something called gifting. So I pretty much every night go on TikTok and I mentor people. And sometimes when people are listening to me mentor someone, they say, oh, that was great advice, Simon, five pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, a community listening, not the wow. person I'm mentoring as such, because I help people for free. Yep. And this, this actually happened to me by accident. So I was mentoring someone and then I closed my live and I made 150 pounds. And remember, my pledge is to not charge people for help. So I felt guilty that I'd made 150 pounds. But people were just saying, oh, cool, Simon, that was nice. You helped that person. That was good advice. A lot of people are very busy, right? They don't have time necessarily to go and help people themselves. So they like to fund or invest in people that are helping people, right? Or resonate with the problem that they see in the world that needs fixing. So people were giving me money. So I decided to give all my TikTok income away. So now when I make those 150 pounds or 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds, on some lives I've made 2,000 pounds, I give it away in the videos that I've just all, mentioned. Yeah. So um, that's how I'm doing it. Not everyone has to do that. You can just go on like Andrea, can go on TikTok and earn money. And so you, you do it through gifting. There's also a function now called battling where I would battle you and, and we could do a battle on TikTok live if you want. And, and basically uh, as the battle happens, both sides make money. Now, I don't particularly like that method of making money because I think the battles are a little bit fake. They're pretend battles between two people. But at the same time, um, I, uh, I went live one day. This is kind of a funny story. And up popped, the handle was Ronaldo. And the person who came on looked just like Ronaldo. And I honestly had to ask myself, is that Ronaldo? It was so, so much like him. And on his side... He had 15,000 people on his live. On my side, I had 2,000 people on my live. So his numbers represented he was Ronaldo, right? He, had, he looked like real Ronaldo. He sounded like real Ronaldo. His handle was Ronaldo. And he had this massive following. And we had a battle. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's how addictive it can get. Uh, and me and Ronaldo, um, I wasn't sure if it was really him or not. I found out later it was an impersonator of Ronaldo, but it looked very real. And he had Ronaldo's handle. Uh, I beat him in a battle. So my community backed me more than Ronaldo's community backed him. And it was a big deal because he'd had a big winning streak. Now, I'm getting into the technicalities of TikTok talk now. But if you have a long winning streak, you get a lot of kudos in TikTok world. And I beat Ronaldo on a TikTok battle. But you earn money when you do that. 
apart from the fun of that story, you actually earn money when these battles take place. And so TikTok's trying to compete with YouTube um, as much as now, of course, YouTube's trying to compete with TikTok. And it's all about basically the creator economy and giving the creators uh, an income to make it worth their time to go on these platforms and bring value to the communities that make this platform so valuable. I also got down here that your book comes out uh, in December. Yeah, this yeah. year. So tell me a bit more about what the book's all about. Yeah, so <laughs> I've been putting off le releasing this book for quite some time and, and partly because um, I want the knowledge in the book I want, to, I want to give people for free. So ironically, all of the stuff that's in the book, you don't need to buy the book, you just go look at the stuff on my YouTube channel, it's there. Um, but I guess saying you're an author and having a book out um, is kind of kind of cool, right? It's what, what everyone wants to say, I'm an author. Um, but in essence, you don't need to buy the book if you learn this basic thing that I write in the book. And it is that luck is a skill. And you can hack luck. And that I've only been successful because I've been lucky. And I studied luck intensely, and it turns out luck breaks down like this. There are two types of luck. There is what I call 2% of your life, which is random, completely random luck. An example of that would be where you're born. There's nothing you can do. You know the saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Well, how hard are you going to work to make sure you're born in England? How hard are you going to work to make sure you're born into a world that gives you those advantages that perhaps born into a different world won't? Yeah. Right? You are lucky if you were born in England. Right? You are lucky if you're born in America. Yeah. Statistically. You know, you'll become more likely to become middle class or, or financially solvent in those markets. Now, uh, that's 2% though. Very, very small percent of your life. Um, there is very few other examples other than like COVID. That's bad luck for everyone. But some people dealt with it in different ways and leveraged it. And, you know, some of the billionaires got richer because of it, right? So it, it but it's 2% random. Now, 98% of your life is luck you can influence. And you influence it in three steps. And I just say before I tell the three steps, it's got nothing to do with hard work. I just want to emphasize this again. Society will push this narrative, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And it's not true. It's not at all true. People keep trying to simplify it into an Instagram quote. Because if it was true, every single nurse in this country would be a millionaire. Right? They work the hardest. Right? They never strike. Because if they do, people die. They go to work every day. Tired, hungry, can't make their rent. They go to work every day right and so if money was related to hard work they'd be millionaires now the truth is it breaks into three parts the first is the more risk you take the luckier you get that's what should be on instagram so it doesn't matter how hard you work but the more risk you take definitely the more luck you'll have and risk links to fear and in modern society people have become fearful of fear so if you feel fear like I'm sure when you first started doing this podcast, you had some fear. Am I good enough? Could I do it? Will anyone listen? Right. But you push through that fear and that's when you take risk. In fact, you do something, you leverage fear. You learn to get really good at doing a podcast because mm. you fear people will judge you. You make sure it works because you fear that it won't. Fear was actually given to us as a gift. Lion coming towards us. Remember how it started. Lions coming towards us. We feel fear. That fear powers us up to think differently to move faster. We literally can run faster when we feel fear. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to leverage fear to take risk. And if you take risk, you get more luck and more luck equals more success. The other two elements are just as important, but maybe um, harder to grasp really, but basically destination. Know your destination. Where are you going? If you get in a car, it doesn't matter how much fuel you've got. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to run out of fuel. Right? You've got to know what you're trying to achieve, where you're trying to go. Once you know where you're trying to go, who's going to be in the car with you? Who needs to be there? What's going to make it a fun destination when you get there? You need to know your destination. No one defines this enough in their lives, right? And the third thing is easy to say but it, it, and hard to define it, but persistence. You've got to make sure you're persistent. And persistence also means sometimes quitting something that's not working, so learning to fail, right? But persistence in your end goal. So I, for example, when I started Fluid, I wrote down the 50 companies that I wanted to work with. And there was this whole study done on like um, successful salespeople. And the study was, I think, by Stanford. And it was like the top 10%, so the very good salespeople, would have something called the five-touch contact plan, which basically meant they would reach out to someone five times before they would give up on that lead. So they might send them an email and then a follow-up email. And then they might ring them. Then they might send them a letter. And then they'll wait a month and then try and contact them again. If they don't hear anything, it will drop into doesn't want our service category, right? But the top 1% of salespeople, so the best of the best, which I put myself into this category very arrogantly, right? But top 1% of women, I didn't know I was one of these people, but this is what I did. 
Every single month for nine years, the top 50 companies that I wanted to work with, I contacted them every single month, no matter what. So I'd send them Merry Christmas or Happy Chinese New Year notes. Or I'd say, this is something I found on the industry that you might find interesting. Or I'd send them ideas for free, even if they might steal them. Every single month. It took me nine years of doing that to get all 50 of those clients as my clients. And I think persistence is key to success. People don't follow through enough. They give up too early and that's because they don't have a purpose. Mm. So underpinning all of this is if you have a purpose, if you know you have to get through to that person because you know if you do, the world you're going to create will be better because of it. You will not stop. You will not give up in a month or you sent one DM and they didn't reply or two messages and they didn't reply. You are nine years later still reaching out to that person because you know how important it is. That's good, man. I, I've taken a lot from what you just said there. Just uh, before we round this podcast up, I mean, outside of doing the TikToks, your social media, YouTube, obviously mentoring people, etc. you know, developing a book and launching a book in December. What else do you do like just for your own time, Simon? Like training, well-being, traveling, what would what, what, you get up to? So um, I used to travel uh, three or four months of the year um, until COVID hit. And now my little boy goes to school. So I'm now in the school holiday uh, traveling bracket. Okay. Um, but before that, I spent three months a year in Bali. And I spend hopefully up to, you know, two or three months a year in Hong Kong. Um, but now with my little boy in school, um, I'm changing my lifestyle a little bit. And I'll do the normal holiday stuff at school holiday periods. Um, but I, I've really got into training recently. Um, because one thing, if I look back at my career, I neglected is my health. I'm so obsessed with my purpose and helping other people and doing the things I enjoy doing, um, being seen and being useful, that sometimes I've neglected exercise. And so now I have a, I built a gym in my house yeah. and I go to the gym every morning and I really enjoy it. And I spend that hour giving it for myself, working out, training. Um, and I'm trying to build that into entrepreneurs' lives as too, making sure. So I go live quite often when I'm in the gym, try to get other entrepreneurs to do the same. And we all kind of work out together. Um, yeah, so that, that on a personal side, but my hobby is my work. Um, mm. and my, even my son who I adore, I spend every moment I can with him. He joins me on all my business trips. He joins me in any video that I think it's appropriate for him to join. He actually helps me. I do a video on TikTok the other day and I said, Aiden, my son's name, what do you think of this? And he critiqued me. He's five years old. He said, daddy, you said it a bit slow. Do it again. I re-recorded it because of his feedback. So mm. I include him in my life and that's how I get balance. I don't separate my work and my life yeah same same here and just on that note of uh, training exercise gym i think there is a correlation certainly a lot of the entrepreneurs winners or successful people that i've been around they, these are people that not all of them but i would say the vast majority are mad driven people and as far as they get up early five six o'clock in the morning they're in the gym starting off their day and then some of them go beyond that they, they will after the gym go for a long walk or they get into ice cold baths and it's all about controlling their mind and controlling their emotions because if they win the morning, they can win the day. Yeah, and I think true. that's such a such a powerful correlation. That's know? very true. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I know there's all these um, you know early morning wake up mm. regimes that everyone preaches. I still go back to like listen to yourself. Yeah. You know, listen to your own body. I personally don't wake up super early. I, I tend to, I like to work late at night and I tend to wake up a little bit later in the mornings. I think you've got to find your own rhythm. Mm-hmm. I've got a five-year-old now, so he wakes me up early. Otherwise, I wouldn't be getting up early. I think you've got to make sure you give your body the rest it needs and follow a routine that suits you, but like social media. Yeah. Well, I, I was one of those people when I was young. I'm 36 now, but when I was like 24, 25, 26, the ego was, was leading me a lot of the time. I have to, you know, get up at five and if I'm a bed between 11 and 12 o'clock, five or six hours will do be fine. And to be honest, I could function on it for like three or four days. But after that, I could really see myself dipping. But the ego again was like, no, 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 you're just being a pussy. You know, mm-hmm. you just need to keep on persisting. But now I'm 36, I've got two kids. One has just turned one years of age, Logan, and Mason's gonna turn four in November. I've really started to realize that actually you've got to find a bit of a, a thing what works for you. Some, mm. of, some of the days I can, I can survive and, and work pretty good on hardly any sleep. But if I keep on doing that day in, day out, I'll just get this burnout. Totally. you got to know yourself. And that's one of the things I think you learn as you get older. But if I wish I could give it to my younger self and just say, you know, just be easy on yourself. But exercising every day is important. Doing some sort of movement. I mean, Definitely. I don't, if you can, I always tell people, if I haven't got, if I haven't got a cold, I'll do some exercise, you know, like, well, I will get a cold at some point. <laughs> so then I won't be able to exercise. So just, you know, exercise if you can every day, do something, even a walk, do something, move. Yeah. 
This is my last question. I came up with a quote which goes like this, be happy, never content. I also built a gym in my, my home uh, in over COVID actually, and I've got it above the doorway, be happy, never content. Now Simon, I've got my own interpretation of what that means and why I come up with that mantra, that kind of life quote to stick by. If I were to ask Simon Squibb, what does be happy, never content mean to you? It's a really interesting saying. At least it gets you thinking, doesn't it? Because I always say um, you uh, money doesn't make you happy unless you're already happy. So, you know, and this kind of linked with like the purpose of life as a life with purpose. So I guess what I've noticed in, in to, to talk about your quote is that you, 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 can, you can work on being happy. It's, a, it's actually an unobtainable thing to be happy all the time, but you can work towards being happy. And I think it links to like having a good relationship and being decent to your fellow man and giving more than you take. But um, I think the way I interpret what your uh, statement is there is about really making sure you don't get lazy, an element of that. Like, you know, you, you, like I see people that make a lot of money, for example, and people listening might not relate to this directly because they're saying, oh, it'd be great if you make loads of money. But actually, when I made loads of money, I found myself for a short period of time there um, losing all purpose. And, and almost like when people retire, they die, right? That's very common. People stop working and within a year or two, they die. It's a very, very common thing. And so I think it's making sure you don't lose that tension. Stress is good for us. P keep pushing yourself. Keep learning. Keep evolving. Keep improving your mind and your body. I think that's what you're saying there, isn't it? You're saying don't sit back. Don't don't take it easy. Actually, that, that adrenaline is what keeps you alive. It's what keeps you interesting. Definitely. But learn to be content and live in the now from time to time so that you are, you know, you appreciate what you've got, but don't stop moving forward. That's it. Simon, thank you very much for your time. I know you're an uber busy guy and uh, hopefully we do a part two at some point. Pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Be happy, never content. And uh, please follow Simon his journey. And uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends, family, and, and your colleagues. Thank you very much, Simon.